Welcome everyone to this session, also on renewable energy. And we are delighted to have a wonderful panel for you this <clears throat> afternoon. Uh, and we're going to start off, at, in, in terms of thinking about this, we're going to look at a variety of, of renewable energy technologies, but also different ways that people use them. And so to start off, we will hear from Reed Spolik. Is that? Okay. Spolik? Okay. Who is the manager of renewable energy for Amazon Web Services. So, Reed? Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Hi, my name is Reed. Uh, I manage renewables for Amazon Web Services. Uh, many of you, I would assume, have heard of Amazon. Today's Prime Day. If you like deals, you should go on Amazon. Uh, but I work for the part of Amazon uh, that's Amazon Web Services, or AWS. Uh, AWS is the cloud computing division of Amazon and is actually the largest cloud computing company in the world. Uh, it's about a $10 billion business right now. Uh, with over a million customers. And so when we're saying customers, we're not saying individual people. We're talking about uh, organizations like Netflix and NASA and Capital One and GE and uh, even the Central Intelligence Agency host their computing, their cloud, on the Amazon, uh, on the Amazon cloud. Uh, and so to power that cloud, we have data centers all over the world, and those data centers use power. Uh, and we have a goal of powering those data centers with 100% renewable energy. Uh, and that's my team's job, is to buy the electrons that march towards, towards steadily achieving that uh, goal of 100%. Uh, we have a goal of being to 40% globally by the end of this year, and we, we think we're on track by a, based on a pretty exciting last year. Last year we signed four power purchase agreements uh, for wind and solar projects in the eastern United States. Uh, a power purchase agreement, or a PPA, is when we agree to buy all the power generated by a new wind or solar project for a set price, and therefore provide that guaranteed revenue for the wind or solar developer to, to build the project, get financed, because they know that there's an offtake. So it, it enables the project to get built. Um, so we signed four of these. The first is with a 150 megawatt wind farm in Indiana. Uh, this went live on January, started producing electricity on, on January 1. Uh, after that, we signed an 80 megawatt uh, wind farm in Virginia. Uh, this is both the largest, I'm, I'm sorry, solar farm in Virginia. This is both the largest solar farm in, in Virginia and in the mid-Atlantic United States. Uh, right now, there's only about 14 megawatts of, of solar in Virginia, so this Additional 80 is going to increase that fairly significantly. Uh, it is on the e is on the eastern shore, Delmarva Peninsula. Um, soon after that, we announced our 208 megawatt wind farm in North Carolina. Uh, this is not only the largest, but the only uh, wind farm in the southeast United States. Uh, the first turbine just went up last week. Pretty exciting. The first wind turbine in the southeast U.S. just went up last week, uh, and then. And then we finally we, we signed up the 100 megawatt uh, wind farm in Ohio. So total of 538 megawatts of new wind and solar making AWS one of the largest purchasers of renewable power in the world. Uh, when th these four projects are built, they'll be able to generate enough electricity every year to power about 150,000 U.S. homes. Uh, that's about the number of people in Cleveland, Ohio is kind of how I like to think about it. Um, and so these PPAs are also building new, uh, allowing new wind and solar projects to get built. Um, and we get excited because this is a really big new capital investment in the industry. Uh, all told publicly, these four projects are going to be uh, about on the order of a billion dollars of, of capital investment. Um, they're going to generate about $5 million a year into their local communities in the form of taxes and, and royalties to the local farmers, for example, who are hosting the wind turbines. Uh, they're creating 1,700 jobs uh, for the design and the construction and operating of these plants. Um, and also new roads. Uh, you, you think about it, to get these big heavy wind turbines into these often rural parts, they have to build these brand new roads to physically be able to do that. And then the local communities have these nice new roads left over af afterwards. Uh, so we're pretty excited about that. Um, it's been an it's been a exciting year and we're hoping to continue to do more. Uh, but part of the reason we're here talking about um, renewable policy is policy is an incredibly important part of the renewable energy industry. 
uh, and we want to acknowledge how important that is and, and talk about how it, how it helps us. Uh, you know, you, we'd start with the extension of the ITC and the PTC last year. Uh, every year it felt like a going out of business sale in the renewable energy space and finally we have the certainty uh, to budget. You know, when you're talking about investments on the order of a billion dollars in a year, these are incredibly important business decisions for groups like Amazon Web Services. And so to provide that certainty is hugely helpful for us to hopefully continue to make these types of investments. Um, in April, we also signed on to an a amicus brief to the Supreme Court uh, in support of the Clean Power Plan. That was Amazon, Google, Microsoft, and Facebook. We called ourselves the, the tech amici, standing up and saying, we, the big tech players, support the Clean Power Plan. Um, we've got a bunch of other ones here that, that we've been involved in. Uh, a solar bill in Virginia. There's a, a setback provision for wind turbines in Ohio that we're actively working on. Um, and I, I think the one that at the federal level we're, we're now starting to look to is, is the MLP Parity Act. Uh, master limited partnerships are effectively a tax construct that, uh, that fossil fuel companies, coal plants, gas pipelines have been utilizing literally for decades, since the 70s. Uh, and they apply to fossil fuel industries. Uh, this, this tax construct currently cannot be used for uh, renewable projects. Tax benefit over here for, for fossil fuel uh, production, not for renewable projects. And all the MLP Parity Act says, hey, why don't we just have this same construct for everything? So everybody's on a level playing field. Uh, uh, you know, everybody always talks about you got to wait for for um, uh, for renewables to be at grid parity. Well, a lot of these fossil fuel plants have had been subsidized for for decades. So all we're asking for is a, is a level playing field. Um, it, it's being looked at at the federal level right now. It's something we are out in favor of. We think it it provides the long term certainty for the industry, uh, so that all energy generation plants, you know, are, are based on the same economics. And and we think this will help us. Uh, continue to invest heavily in renewables going forward. Thank you for your time. Thanks very much, Reid. And we can't wait for you to be 100% renewables. And then, then you can Where's throw a job? really big party. <laughs> right. Okay. So we'll now turn to Jim Riley, who is the Senior Vice President for Federal Legislative Affairs with AWEA, the American <coughs> Drug Energy Association. Jim. Thanks. And we're thrilled to have customers like uh, Amazon and others. You know, they're one of the stories of the last year in wind, there's, there's several good ones that I'll touch on, but one of them is that the largest source of, of uh, new demand did not come from utilities, but it came from customers like Amazon, Facebook, Google, who are entering long-term agreements for the product that wind manufacturers sell. And it's something that, as you said, there's a lot of benefit to companies that are, uh, are purchasing that. Last year, wind remained number one. Uh, we, we lead the world in the US here with wind energy. China has more turbines, but the ones in the US are better and are spinning more and are connected to the power grid, so are actually generating and delivering more electricity. Um, also, interesting fact, there's, there's now more wind power installed in the world than there is nuclear, which is something that as we look at the, the future trend, we think that that will continue to grow. Uh, in the US, the number one source of new electricity that came online last year was wind, more than solar and more than gas. We saw uh, a, the third largest year for new wind installations coming online was in 2015. Today, there's about 75 megawatts uh, or gigawatts, sorry, of uh, wind operating in the U.S. It is enough for about 20 million homes. The number one state for wind, anybody have a guess? Texas, by far and above. The, the number one wind state today is Texas. And again, that's a trend we expect to continue for quite some time. Um, the the other thing that's interesting with wind is it's, at the national level, it's 5% of the U.S. electricity supply, but in some states, significantly above that. Uh, anybody guess what Iowa is generating? Their average wind contribution from, or electricity contribution from wind? 
20%, higher, lower? Higher. higher. They're at 31% last year. Uh, South Dakota is at 25%, and Kansas is at 20%. So in many states, obviously, where there's wind, wind is a, a big part of their energy supply. Uh, and in some states, on some days, we're seeing even higher numbers. In Colorado, during a period last year, they were over 60% supplied by wind energy. Last year was a record job year for wind, uh, 88,000 jobs in the wind industry. And that includes manufacturing, that includes construction, that includes operation. And the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics, which tracks all kinds of interesting things, said that the number one, uh, the, the job sector that was growing the most in the U.S. as far as percent increase is the wind energy technician. In Texas, back to uh, one of my favorite states, 24,000 wind jobs last year. And, and what's driving all that demand are a couple of things, and then I'll talk about what needs to keep it going. Uh, wind is two-thirds cheaper to come online today than it was six years ago. And the technology that goes into building the machines, constructing the turbines, and operating them continues to drive that price down so that wind is delivering a low-cost energy source for industry, for homeowners, and for other energy consumers. And one of the really good stories we also have to tell is that manufacturing of wind turbines is coming into the U.S., whereas there was a time where some of the machines were built overseas and shipped here, more and more companies are seeing this market as a robust and long-term one, and they're building factories here because, as was mentioned, these are not small things that you drive through a, a, a city environment. You, you, you want to build them as close as you can to where you're going to construct them. Um, and let me just close with, with two things about the future, and then we'll leave time for questions. Uh, wind, the, the wind belt runs pretty much Texas up to the Dakotas. That's where most of the, the rich wind resource is. That's not where most of the energy demand in the U.S. is. So like other energy sectors, wind is reliant on a robust transmission system, and we don't feel we have what we need today. So working with Congress, working with the states to provide a uh, more robust and appropriately located transmission grid will be something that the wind industry is involved with. And then uh, some of you may have followed the comments from last year where we saw this Congress extend the production tax credit for, at the time, uh, five years. So we have about three and a half years left on that. And the industry is working hard to make sure that everything that they can do to deliver on the promise that the five-year PTC extension uh, lays out, that, that they take advantage of that. And that includes, again, continuing to bring down costs, develop new customers, and work on transmission. So we're very optimistic about what we are seeing this year, and the next couple years just look continually strong for wind energy. Uh, we think it will meet the demand that we see today and also continue the track towards a 20% target by 2020, as, uh, I'm sorry, 20% by 2030 as set out by the Department of Energy. So happy to take any questions. Thanks, Jim. Uh, there are a number of federal agencies that are very, very important to the development of energy, and particularly renewable energy. And so we are now going to hear from John Kalish, who is the Chief for the Office of Renewable Energy Coordination at the Bureau of Land Management, BLM, at the Department of Interior. John? All right. Well, thank you. Uh, I'd like to frame uh, this discussion a little bit and then tell you who we in the BLM are. Um, in a way to, to frame what we're going to talk about, uh, in June 2013, uh, the President directed the Department of Interior uh, to approve at least 20,000 megawatts of renewable energy capacity on public lands by 2020 as part of his Climate Action Plan. Uh, for us in the BLM, uh, this is our challenge, and for a subset of it, uh, the staff, uh, this is certainly a passion. 
Uh, being on the East Coast, uh, I feel real uh, obligated to at least go into a very short description of who the Bureau of Land Management, or BLM for short, is. Uh, the BLM uh, administers over 245 million acres, surface acres, uh, more than any other federal agency in the United States. Uh, most of this land is in the 12 western states, including Alaska. Uh, we also manage 700 million acres of subsurface mineral estate throughout the nation, including 58 million acres of federal minerals underlying private surface uh, called uh, split estate. And we manage these lands under a multiple use mission uh, set forth in the Public Land Policy and Management Act of 1976, uh, mandating that we manage uh, these lands for a, a whole variety, a whole spectrum of uses, uh, from mining, energy development, livestock, gra livestock grazing, recreation, timber harvesting, uh, while also protecting a wide array of natural, cultural, and historic resources uh, we also manage and protect some of the nation's most scenic and natural landscapes, including uh, 221 wilderness areas and 25 uh, designated uh, national monuments. And if you've never been out west to see your public lands, I sure encourage you to do so. Uh, as you can guess, uh, these vast stretches of uh, public lands uh, have a significant renewable energy potential and as such uh, can contribute to the nation's renewable energy portfolio. Uh, of the 245 million acres of surface, uh, we in the BLM have determined that 20 million acres uh, have wind energy development potential. Uh, 19 million acres of land have excellent solar energy potential. And of course, they're mainly in the states in the southwest, the six states. Um, and vast lands in the 11 western states uh, and Alaska uh, have an untapped uh, geothermal energy potential, uh, essentially over 100 million acres uh, uh, of that potential. Just a little history of how BLM got into the renewable energy business. Uh, the BLM started uh, in the wind energy business uh, back in the early 1980s in the San Gregorio Pass near Palm Springs, uh, California. And if you've been out there, you've seen the wind farms and the, uh, it's quite a wind resource. Uh, in 1982, uh, BLM completed the San Gregorio Pass Wind Energy Project, EIS, uh, assessing wind energy development in that area and responding to development uh, demand. Uh, the first uh, wind energy proposals uh, uh, were initiated shortly thereafter, and San Gregorio Pass has developed over the years uh, into today's uh, uh, 21 wind energy authorizations uh, within the pass, encompassing 3,500 acres of public lands, totaling 1,000 wind turbines. Uh, we do have some old ones, uh, around uh, 65 to 100 uh, kilowatt all the way up to two and a half megawatt machines uh, and an overall installed capacity today of uh, 239 megawatt uh, megawatts. So this program uh, has really grown over the years and really allowed BLM to uh, kind of cut its teeth on uh, renewable energy development. We also uh, really work to expand uh, wind energy development on other lands throughout the Bureau, lands that uh, have uh, uh, excellent uh, wind uh, resource. Uh, we uh, developed uh, interim policies that would guide that process for the rest of the Bureau. Uh, but in 2003, we prepared a programmatic EIS uh, relating to the development of wind energy on public lands, uh, completed in 2005. And this EIS um, analyzed uh, uh, the development of wind energy projects uh, amended 20, I mean 52 BLM land use plans to allow for expansion of wind energy development uh, across public lands. Uh, and then BLM offices uh, utilize this EIS in analyzing impacts. Uh, and it was very valuable uh, because of a set of uh, identified best management practices uh, designed to facilitate wind development and uh, very importantly uh, to protect uh, uh, resources on public lands. Uh, the BLM then uh, in 2008 issued uh, more detailed uh, policy and guidance uh, pertaining to protection of uh, 
of uh, various resources, uh, birds, wildlife habitat, resource values, visual resources, um, uh, really trying to make uh, wind energy compatible uh, with uh, uh, other uses on public lands. Uh, we also updated rental fees and bonding requirements and uh, continue to refine the policy uh, to deal with issues such as eagle protection, uh, facilitating uh, project proposals by uh, uh, stating what uh, should be in a, uh, a project uh, plan of development and ensuring protection of BLM lands uh, through important, through appropriate levels of environmental analysis. Uh, the success of all of this bureau-wide is that it has resulted in BLM authorizing 40 wind energy projects that total approved capacity of uh, 5,608 megawatts, enough to supply the power needs of nearly 2 million homes. Uh, in addition, uh, the BLM has authorized hundreds of wind energy testing sites with 59 pending and 23 authorized wind testing applications. Um, the BLM currently has 20 uh, pending wind energy development applications over about, 20, about 264,000 acres of public lands uh, across uh, Arizona, California, Idaho, Nevada, Oregon, Utah, and Wyoming. So, uh, the wind energy program has, expand, uh, has uh, expanded uh, from the early days. We are developing also a project, uh, it's called the West Wide uh, Wind Mapping Project. It's a collaborative effort uh, between BLM and uh, DOE's uh, National Renewable Energy Lab and Argonne National Laboratory to generate uh, maps and geospatial data reflecting uh, high value wind areas and uh, potential conflict areas. Uh, and this is really a, a way to focus in on the best areas for development. Uh, moving on to solar, uh, the Energy Act of 2005 spurned interest in solar energy development on public lands. By 2008, uh, the BLM was receiving, or had received 125 applications uh, out west. <coughs> um, I was working in an office in Southern California and I felt like we had 125 in our office just by ourselves. It was uh, interesting times. Um, in an interest to respond to that demand, we developed an, a programmatic EIS uh, with the Department of Energy uh, that uh, did some really important things. It provided a blueprint for utility scale, utility, or utility scale solar energy permitting in these six states uh, by establishing solar energy zones, 17 of which um, that are uh, areas of uh, essentially low conflict, uh, areas of, uh, of high quality uh, solar uh, development uh, uh, potential, but areas where low, low resource conflict, uh, trying to focus in where uh, we could in a more efficient manner um, uh, 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 proceed in, in uh, uh, processing uh, uh, solar energy projects. Um, and then lastly, I'll move very quickly on to geothermal energy development. Um, uh, we do uh, handle geothermal uh, leasing across uh, BLM and Forest Service lands in 11 western states. Um, uh, we have in 2007 published regulations uh, uh, that dealt with competitive leasing, uh, uh, simplified royalty calculations and providing administration of, of geothermal leases and presently, we generate over $12 million, million dollars in federal royalties each year, each year with 50% of those royalties uh, shared uh, by the states and 25% by local counties. Uh, we have two things that are going on. Our competitive wind and solar leasing rule for public lands is in its final stage. Uh, this rule sets out uh, to address fair market value for renewable energy development, uh, incentivizes uh, development in pre-screen low conflict areas, and promotes a predictable, uh, predictability for de uh, developers in permitting and refining um, uh, what are appropriate reclamation bonds for our wind energy projects. So back to that goal of 20,000 megawatts, renewable energy by 2020, uh, we've come a long way. Uh, we presently have approved uh, close to 17,000 megawatts. Uh, our efforts to make permitting more efficient and focus on development in low conflict areas will keep this on track. 
and uh, ensure that uh, uh, development is done efficiently and in the right places. So, Great. thank you. Thank you, John. And that gives us a good segue in terms of thinking about geothermal to turn to Carl Gaywell, who's the executive director of Geothermal Energy Association. Didn't know you'd make me sit next to my landlord. <laughs> <laughs> that was by design. Allie, would you take a minute and pass out the, um, yeah. I have a presentation which we can't show you, but we're going to give you a copy of. And better. Carol, I learned the value of having structure when from David Brower, the famous environmentalist. I was on a panel with David once, and he got criticized by someone in the audience saying, you know, you just ramble. And he goes, ramble? I always have structure to my talk. He says, no, there was no structure to your talk. I said, yes, there was. There was the beginning when I started talking. There was the middle when I was in the middle of talking. And there was a conclusion when I finished. <laughs> so this will keep me on track. Uh, geothermal energy, as everyone here is going to tell you, has great benefits. As so does wind, so does solar, et cetera. I want to note that of 39 power plants we've brought, on, brought online in the last 10 years, 38 of them have been essentially zero emission power plants. So we've really come a long way, and our prices have also come down, not as much as wind, but they've been reducing. We have firm and flexible output as well, meaning, for example, the power plant in Pune, Hawaii, can ramp up and down to match the needs of the grid. So if you had more wind and solar, it can come in and help fill in those, those blanks to meet the demand in a reliable manner. In the U.S. today, we've got about 3,700 megawatts of geothermal installed. We, have, we estimate we have 1,250 planned megawatts in the development pipeline. That's about a 30 percent increase in the pipeline. And that's still only a fraction of the resource. The USGS estimates there's at least 30,000 megawatts of conventional resource yet to be developed. And the MIT study looked at advanced technology called EGS, which could bring on another 100,000 megawatts. In short, we have great potential for enormous growth in the future. And we're for relatively optimistic. The, uh, some of the things that have us optimistic are the PATH Act. The PTC was extended at least to the end of next year. We did not get the generous treatment solar and wind got, but we're hoping that Congress will address that, and I'll get that to that in a minute. But at least this year, projects that start will qualify for the production tax credit. The Senate has passed the Energy Policy Modernization Act, which includes significant provisions to help streamline the leasing and permitting for geothermal projects. And what we're seeing at the state level has us very optimistic with California, Hawaii, Oregon, and other states looking like they're going to major RPSs which is the RPS is as they move up to 50, 55 percent, we think are going to have more room for geothermal simply because of the analysis which is now underway in California. CERT, the Center for Energy Efficiency and Renewable Technologies, worked on a low carbon grid study. There's one of the findings of their study was that a diverse portfolio gave better results. So for example, they looked at one, one case called the heavy solar case where they had 55 percent renewables with solar dominating new, new procurement. And they compared that to a case where they substituted 1,250 megawatts of baseload power for solar, or th actually for 3,800 megawatts of solar. That case came in with almost no curtailments, and the actual cost was $1.1 billion less per year to have a diverse portfolio with, with technology such as hydropower, geothermal, biomass involved as well. So you can see as you move out to these high renewable portfolio standards, the value of other technologies becomes important to recognize. I'm not saying that we will replace solar or wind in terms of total megawatts, but it's getting the right mix. And that's where the states are clearly headed, and particularly in the West, which is where geothermal has most of its technology. So what are our, what's holding us back in the market? Well, the asymmetrical subsidies, the, the PATH Act also and a small problem that it treated different technologies differently. The 2005 Energy Policy Act, I would say, and I think Jeff would agree, was the first time there was an attempt to make sort of a across-the-board treatment of renewables with incentives. The PATH Act really singled out wind and solar for major benefits, left everyone else hanging. There's been a lot of discussion about what we call the orphan technologies, but we hope that Congress will find time this year, maybe in September, to address that and, and pick up some of the issues that are left hanging back, back in December. We also, the other thing that's holding us back at the state level is the states often look at what's cheapest. They're, not, they're trying to figure out how do we make this into a system-wide element, or not just look at 
what's the cheapest thing to do to my house today if I have to put an insulation in my roof or an insulation in my windows? But look at it as a system and say, what technologies fit in that system? And as I said, the search study and others, E3 study and other studies, are showing that a systems approach means that base load technologies and geothermal will get more of a role in the coming markets. And of course, natural gas prices remain low. Compared to the U.S., the world market is going very strong. We're seeing sustained strong growth in the world market where we're seeing 13 gigawatts today. We're estimating that by 2020, there'll be an additional five gigawatts or more online worldwide. In the U.S., we can't make that prediction given the short-term nature of the tax credits. It's going to be difficult to come up with any prediction for the United States today. Um, but I think that for Washington, there are three key issues. First is equalize the tax credits. Come in with a across-the-board long-term tax credit that applies to all the renewable technologies based upon their carbon reduction or some other factor that's rational and systematic. So number two is leasing and permitting. And that's not to beat up on the BLM because their problem is often resources. I mean, you were talking about when you were in the office in California, the problem wasn't they didn't have enough people coming in asking for permits. They didn't have enough people to process the permits. Many of the offices I've seen, the problem there is resources. They need to have the people to do the job right. And then they need to have Congress write laws which they can administer properly. And then lastly, R&D, and I want to commend the Department of Energy for a strong R&D program for geothermal. I think their new forge effort is really looking at the advanced technologies that we need. And together, the, the tax equalization, leasing and permitting, such as proposed by the, DO, by the Senate Energy Bill, and a good R&D program will make a strong future for geothermal in the U.S. and worldwide. So, so with that, I'll take questions. Thank you, Carol. Okay. Thanks, Carl. And I must say, I think that geothermal is a very underappreciated renewable resource that actually we have in this country in quite abundance. So I really encourage you to learn more about it. It's very, very important baseload technology as well. So it's, again, part of the whole family of resources. And so we're going to talk about another important baseload uh, technology as well as part of this whole family. And we are very glad to have our neighbor from the north, uh, Jacob Irving, who is the president for the Canadian Hydropower Association. Thank you very much, Carol, and thank you. We really honor the opportunity to be able to come and speak about uh, hydropower from a Canadian perspective and, and widen the perspective a little bit to a North American one, uh, and really appreciate it. Um, so I, I'll ask a question to the room. Um, <clears throat> When they do cross-statistical analysis of professional sports, who comes up as the number one professional athlete of all time? Any guesses? Ali. Yeah. <laughs> now, Ali, I think, would probably win in terms of individual, for sure. Um, for professional sports teams, professional team sports, and, yeah, you guessed it, it's Wayne Gretzky. Um, beats out Michael Jordan, beats out Babe Ruth, beats out many others. Um, and why? A um, few different reasons. One of them um, is that um, in his career, he had 3,000 points. Uh, number two, I'm, I'm rounding. Number two behind him is Marc Messier with about 2,000 points. Uh, so Wayne Gretzky is one and a half times ahead of the number two ranking person. He's untouchable. And it also just so happens that Marc Messier scored a, many, a good many of his goals, racked up a good number of his points, while he played with Wayne Gretzky for about four years. And the reason why this is important is um, Wayne Gretzky is considered the best of all time because, yes, he does hold the scoring record. He has scored more goals than any other hockey player. Um, and he is a country mile ahead of the number two in that department as well. But they call him the great one because he also has the largest number of assists. He set up more players than any other. Uh, Marc Messier was the beneficiary of this. And so what does this have to do with hydropower? <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and Canadian hydropower in particular. 
I often like to say that hydropower uh, is the Wayne Gretzky of electricity generation. In, can in the Canadian context, it is the greatest. And why? Because it is clean and renewable in its own right. Wayne Gretzky was the number one goal scorer. In Canada, hydropower is the number one source of electricity generation. It's not just the number one renewable source of electricity generation. It's the number one source of electricity generation in Canada. It's over 61% of our electricity. That's how we make electricity in our country. But it also makes other forms of generation great. The new renewables that are coming on in Canada and the United States, wind and solar, and the assistance that they sometimes need in integrating the, to the grid. Well, hydropower is the most dispatchable form of electricity generation that there is. Point final. If you put aside um, even issues of climate change and uh, pollution, etc., you would still be building hydropower today because it is the most dispatchable form of electricity. You can turn it on and off faster than any other source. And so in Canada, our great one, our hydropower, enables the other new renewables that are coming on. And that is all to the good. The more incremental wind and solar you can bring on and that you can graft onto the backbone of a Canadian hydro system, the better it is for Canada, the United States, and the world in terms of driving down greenhouse gas emissions. So this is something that uh, we're very good at. And as I often put it, um, I think in the Canadian context, and I'm proud to, to proclaim this, and I'm even proud to debate it with people at different fora, uh, hydropower is, in Canada anyway, hydropower is the best way to make electricity. Um, is it the only way? No. Is it perfect? No one is. But when you look at the way uh, that it's created and the way that it helps other forms of generation, it's the best choice. And so um, we're very proud of the fact that it's the number one source, 61% of our electricity. But the good news I would like to share with everyone here is that it is growing and that it can grow even more. In the last 10 years, we've brought on about 5,000 megawatts of new Canadian hydropower. And over the next 10 years, we'll bring on about another 5,000 megawatts. And we are interconnected with you. We do trade electricity back and forth, our two countries. Uh, Canada is a net exporter of electricity. We send you more electricity than you send us. But the majority of what we send you is hydropower. It's about 80% of the electricity we send you. And you, in turn, use that to drive down your emissions. Every terawatt hour of hydropower that we send you drives down U.S. emissions. But you also use it to firm up your other renewables, your wind and solar, and it works out to be quite a good arrangement. And in fact, in the middle of the continent, um, we have a stellar example of international cooperation not just energy policy, but international cooperation uh, between the province of Manitoba, the states of Wisconsin, Minnesota, and North Dakota. And this is energy policy by design between the two countries. It's, it's three states, one province, and two countries getting along to have each other's clean renewable electricity enable each other. And what's essentially happening is that the wind in North Dakota is being unlocked in part by Canadian hydropower to the north. The load centers are Minnesota and Wisconsin, and what will happen is new wind energy will come in and feed those two states. It will lessen their reliance on coal and other emitting sources. It'll drive down their greenhouse gas emissions. But of course, what happens when the wind doesn't blow and it needs to be backed up? That's when you look north to us. And Manitoba to the north is blessed with hydropower, the province itself is 98% hydropower driven. It gets all of its electricity practically from hydropower. And what it will do is when the wind isn't blowing in, in North Dakota, it will send down dispatchable Canadian hydropower to back it up. And so what we have between our two countries is we have a stellar example of clean renewables enabling clean renewables. And the best backstop to wind and solar and others is hydropower because it is the most dispatchable form of electricity. You can turn it on and off faster than any other. And it is also clean and renewable in its own right. So uh, what I mostly wanted to do is just share with you this good news, let you know that we already have these arrangements, but also let you know that 
As much hydropower as we send you, and as big business and as important as this is to Canada, it represents less than 1% of your annual electricity consumption in the United States. So this good news is less than 1% of your electricity. We humbly submit that maybe that should grow a bit. <laughs> if, if it grew to 2%, uh, we'd be over the moon, and you might not even notice. Uh, and, this, and this is the kind of opportunity that we have before us. And I'll just end it by backstopping that I think that our, the leadership of our countries get this. Um, your president came to visit us in Ottawa just a couple weeks ago, and there was a, a, along with the president from Mexico. And you may all be aware of the new target, and the target is going to be to have 50% of North America's electricity be clean by 2025. Um, it's an ambitious target. I think it's quite doable. Right now we're about 37%. We want to grow to 50 one of the reasons why we are at 37% is because Canada disproportionately contributes to that base. We're, quite, we're, we're a big part of that base. One of the reasons we'll get to 50 is because we can really help you. All you've got to do is let us. And so we're just here to say that we've got a great arrangement. Things are going terrific. Let's just do more of the same to our mutual advantage. Thanks. Okay, Jacob, do we get free maple syrup to go with? <laughs> the maple syrup will cost you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we're now going to turn to the other part of the North America hydro uh, situation, and we'll hear from Jeff Leahy, who's the Deputy Executive Director of the National Hydropower Association. Well, I feel like Jacob just, you know, basically did everything I needed to do with my presentation. But um, really what I'll do is I'll talk a little bit about what's going on in the United States, which is a little bit different than what's going on from Canada um, in, in scope and also uh, in the new development that we're working on. Some statistics for you. Um, hydropower makes up 6 to 7% of total electricity generation in the United States today, a little less as a percentage than Canada, but still for our system, a significant amount uh, of clean renewable electricity. That translates into almost half of all renewable electricity generation in the United States today, just under half. So if you add up all of the renewables and their generation, we make up the other half of that generation currently. And that's even in a year in 2015 where states like California and the Southwest had a significant drought and reduced generation uh, in that year. Um, the hydropower industry in the U.S., the, my organization, we represent any technology that makes power from water. So that includes conventional hydro. It includes pump storage resources, which if you don't know what that is, you can talk to me afterwards. Um, and also now new marine energy and hydrokinetic technologies as well. So all of those member companies are involved in my organization. Every state but two has hydropower generating facilities in them. I think it's Mississippi and Delaware are the only two uh, states that don't have hydropower facilities. But every state gets hydropower generation uh, provided to them by one of the companies that, that owns it. Um, and in some parts of the United States, obviously, we are very much like Canada. The Pacific Northwest gets 70 to 80 percent of their electricity from hydropower, U.S. hydropower. Um, again, which forms the backbone for bringing in a lot of other renewables into that system as well. One of the big misconceptions in the United States today is that there is no growth potential in the hydropower industry, and that is completely false. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, one of the key things I wanted to leave you with today is that in about two weeks, the Department of Energy is scheduled to release a hydropower vision report very similar to what was done for the wind industry several years ago. We've been working as a partner with them, I think as AWIA did uh, on the wind vision uh, for the last two years. We're very excited about it. So stay on the lookout for that. Again, that should come out in about two weeks. We're gonna be in Minneapolis, Minnesota, both uh, Jacob and I for um, an international hydropower conference where that will be released. Um, it's first of its kind. Uh, it'll talk about the contributions of the existing hydropower system, what it means in terms of emissions reductions and, and uh, costs and benefits, uh, but then it'll also talk about growth opportunities. Um, I also want to talk about two couple of energy uh, policy priorities, and Carl mentioned this, and I think some others in the er earlier panels have mentioned this. 
Carol, we should have had you like giving us updates on whether or not the Senate has voted to go to conference on the energy bill, which is about to happen in about five minutes, I think. Uh, but the energy bill, um, both for us in the Senate and in the House, contains important provisions uh, in, for hydropower uh, licensing improvements, for R&D, for the new technologies like marine energy. Uh, and hydrokinetics, as well as for the promotion of new development of all types of hydropower in the United States, domestic development, uh, including pump storage. So we are very much looking forward to that vote, uh, and we hope that uh, it will be successful. We are, believe it will be, and obviously that the Senate and the House can get to the work uh, of the conference and get to an energy bill by the end of the year. The second um, issue that I raise is, again, the tax incentives. Um, as many of you have heard, and I think as what sometimes is lazily reported in the press, is that renewables received long-term extensions at the end of 2015. That is not the case. Not all renewables received long-term extensions at the end of 2015. Um, hydropower, marine energy did not, as Carl mentioned, did geothermal, biomass, biogas, a whole bunch of technologies. So we'll see their, extent, uh, their incentives expire at the end of the year. Uh, that will be a devastating blow to realizing some of this potential that is going to be coming out and analyzed in this uh, DOE report if we do not see those um, tax incentives extended by the end of the year. So um, we have plenty of opportunities for new development. Um, my industry and our developers are very engaged in this issue. We are looking to uh, partner with uh, other companies, including the end users, uh, who may ultimately uh, be utilizing some of that power that would come from those projects. Um, you know, as was mentioned before, some of the high-tech companies uh, like Google, like Facebook, like uh, Microsoft, like Yahoo, um, they like hydropower-rich areas of this country because we do provide predictable, um, affordable, low-cost uh, generation. So, uh, and they have cited their facilities in areas uh, which do rely heavily on hydropower. So I think I'll end it there so that we can get to questions. I thank you very much for your attention, particularly as you had to sit through six of us uh, to get to the, this point in the conversation. So thank you once again. Well, thank you all very, very much. <laughs>